Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, well, give me one second. I have to. I have to very quickly do something. Uh, talk amongst yourselves. Well, today is Thursday, and is the Holy Week next week, starting on Sunday. It's uh, it's what we call Easter. It's, oh, okay. It's what we call Holy Easter. Week. Ah, we call it Holy Week. It's well, you can call it you can call it Holy Week as well. I okay. mean, broadly broadly speaking. So that means that um, really, I didn't know that uh, it was not this Friday. <laughs> So, but anyway, it's not this Friday. No, it's, <laughs> not, it's, it's, it's from Sunday to nobody ever tells. No, it's, 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 no. it's Palm Sunday next this Sunday, I think. Right. Okay. No, no, he's 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 put his head above the parapet. I think you better go and do your magic and let's get on with it. Okay. Now today we're going to talk with Michael Fitzgerald about a lot of very interesting things and very 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 complicated things as well. Michael Fitzgerald, as I live and breathe. How the devil are you? I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> good to see you, sir. I've just, I've just realised that my, my applause. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it disappeared. I was about to push something. I was about to push this. <laughs> but it's not. It's Which is not. strangely appropriate in some ways. So you did these uh, subtitles for this um, uh, show of um, Michael? Oh yes. So um, now. People can watch the uh, the things that we've been talking about. We were talking about last week, A Wanted Man. Um, all, all three episodes are there. And the second and third one is actually upgraded to high definition. Well, at least the format is high definition. And it's all been subtitled in Spanish. So that our people can see you. Because that's how I roll. <laughs> but don't record it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, Ab no, no. Absolutely not. It's there for posterity. That's the word I've been looking for, posterity. But it's, it's you know, if you want to show some, some friends to South America. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> for instance, or Spain, people that... Well, there's know. a lot of people who speak Spanish out there. Anyway, so so anyway, because we talked about it so much, I thought it would give, be a, a great opportunity to for, for everybody to see to sh it. To share it. Yeah, so... Um, you are so good. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. I think you should go back to being blonde. I don't know about you. <laughs> Everybody told you, right? <laughs> At the time. <laughs> I've been blonde three or four times. It's better. Blondes do have more fun. It's true. <laughs> really? Well, there was a phrase. Is it true blondes have more fun? And yes, it's true. It's true. Wow. Um, I'd, I've I've been blonde, but I've never really had that much fun. No, but you you no. give fun to others. Oh, well, that's how it works. <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
I'm, I'm nothing more than a than a recreational fluffer. That's that's all I am. I see. Uh, there could be worse things worse things in life. Now, what 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 were you talking about before we hit the credits or something? You were talking about we're going to talk about something very 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 interesting. Yeah, we were talking about the different requirements for classical and modern roles. I think that is an interesting theme. Now, are we to, are we today. is we talking about film and and telly and or theatre? Well, it's classical and modern, modern we're talk, roles. We're talking both. You know, we're talking classical playwrights and then modern acting, which is film. But it's also on stage. Um, I think, I can't remember, but I think it was Michel Saint-Denis, who, who was one of the people who founded the Old Vic Theatre School, who said that a modern actor is, if you take if you look at like a hand that goes into a glove if you are in a modern entity you are the hand you are the living bit and you pull on the glove which is a character particularly i mean particularly if it's a character and you bring that to life using you the opposite is true of classical drama, though people don't do this anymore, but I think to the detriment of the drama, because most classical drama is looking for a tragic flaw, if it is a tragedy, in somebody. And the actor becomes the glove. And the character as written uses you. It creeps into you, it is the hand. The character is the thing that lives and it is generated by the playwright. And therefore, a lot of classical training in the past has been to do with making yourself, I mean, not everybody can do this, making yourself as neutral as possible so that you can see what you're meant to be looking at in that person. It's just as, it's nothing that big. It's like people say, oh, television acting is incredibly different from film <laughs> acting. No, it isn't. You just act. And the same is true of the stage. You just have to make sure that the old lady in the back row who, you know, has a hearing aid can hear you. You just have to kind of think that. You don't have to shout. You have to think your voice to wanting them to hear you. But it's... It, it, it's Sorry, I, I want to I want to interject just ju just just for a moment. It's it's one mm -hmm. of my one of my observations about th th this idea of, of the voice in the theatre. I know we're going slightly off topic here, but the thing that's always struck me is the women who who seem to do very well in the theatre, particularly in British theatre, is the only thing I can really opine about. Are the are the women who have um, a lower register to their voice? They have they have a wider range to their voice. There's there's a certain something which I've seen that happens here, and it might have to do with the <clears throat> the w the way people are trained. But there's so much shrieking that goes on that I can't I can't I be think, doing. I with think it. what happens, and I mean what happened in Victorian times, and the reason people used to faint is that they wore corsets hmm. and they could only breathe to about their neck, and therefore they weren't getting enough oxygen. One of the jokes in drama school, but it's true, is breathe with your bottom, which is not to do with breathing with your bottom, however funny that is. It's to do with using the whole lung and thinking of speaking with your whole body. And when you stand on a stage, feel your weight and speak from your feet or from the bottom of you and let it come up through the body and use the entire body because the body is filled with resonators. And if you make this sound here, you want to open up the body to, to all the sound. Now, you can't be thinking that when you're acting. I mean, you, you know, that is something you think about when you train. But once you've trained, but that will lead to there being a lower voice. But on the other hand, there was a very, very famous actress in France called Madeleine Renaud, mm -hmm. who was married to Jean-Louis Barrault. And they had a company of Renaud Barrault for a long time. And she had a little bell-like voice, one of the most magical things I've ever heard in a theater. And she never shouted. And it just 
traveled. It was, you know, trying to push your voice if it's in a higher register might lead to shrieking, which is really unpleasant. Most people back away from that, which is the opposite to what you're trying to get. It isn't that hard to be heard. And now, of course, particularly in musicals, but, but also in straight plays, people are now being using microphones. I find that a little bit disappointing in that the whole thing about live theater is that it is you in a room looking at somebody else and they speak to you and anything like, well, even lighting and microphones and some <laughs> set slightly distance everybody from the performer. I think Peter Brook in his most famous book, The Empty Space, says that the only two things that are required for an act of theater to take place is for there to be a spectator and a human being in front of them. You don't even need a writer. You don't need lighting if you're in the open air. You don't need a set. You don't need anything. Now, of course, a lot of people are making their livings being directors and designers and all of that. And that is all part of the theatrical art. And I love it, frankly. But that very, very pure equation is one human being listening to and watching somebody and caring about them. If you haven't got that, you haven't got anything, really. You've got a lot of designs and microphones and things. Yes. Also, I, I find out when I'm playing in theater that um, that we listen a lot to the audience, a lot. Yes, you do. Uh, like, you a, like, from. like a human being, like, uh, you know, like in a conversation. <laughs> That's and right. You, and you should listen. <clears throat> you should listen in person and you should listen as, a, as, as an actor. Because that gives you a, a tremendous insight about how they feel, how how you can change something for the best, and how you know how is the <clears throat> effect of you know of whatever you you are doing. And I think that is in the uh, essence of the communication of theater, right? The listening. I think that's the absolutely theater. right. Now, I mean, it goes in with that thing that I said before of three percent of you, whatever you're playing, however emotional, however many people you're killing or whatever is going on, or if you're in the middle of a war or whatever, 3% of you has to sit in the auditorium and watch yourself to make sure that you don't go off the rails. Because, you know, um, I remember when I was doing something even on camera and it was, well, it was, it was the interrogation of John and the voice, the dialect coach said, one day, because it was a very involved thing with a very short space of time, she says, you need to swim to the edge of the pool and climb out so that you can dive in more deeply the next time. And I know what she, she don't, you don't lose yourself in it. It is an art form. It's not, it isn't real, ultimately. And you are responsible <coughs> as an actor to delivering that role and those ideas, or just delivering that character to the audience so that they can make their own mind up. The the interesting thing, um, I remember seeing Richard Dreyfuss talking about doing theatre on Broadway, and one of the other actors in the show came off one night and said, hey man, I gotta tell you, tonight I saw the fourth wall. And Richard okay. Dreyfuss said to him, I think you need to perhaps go see a therapist or something. <laughs> um, because that's not healthy. Um, one of the things that's happened is, the, I don't know if it's happened in London yet, but it's very popular here, and I've explained the dynamic on several occasions, a thing called micro-theatre. Um, it hasn't, I don't know, I, I hope it doesn't make its way to London. Micro-theatre is a way of using very tiny spaces in which you can probably fit a couple of actors and maybe five or six members of an audience the size of, you know, slightly smaller than most people's living rooms. And people do a play and it lasts about 15 minutes. And I have a, I have a fundamental problem with it. And 
it's not because of the acting is bad or or any or the fact that the you know or the writing or anything like that or even the length of it my my argument is that i can never imagine anything great being done there and the reason that nothing great can be done i don't think is because there is no aesthetic distance between audience and actors they're effectively you're effectively inhabiting the same space and there is no frame around them um the interesting thing about um, the you know voice in the theater and w the reason I was mentioning that about the actresses is uh, I've been fortunate enough to see Vanessa Redgrave, uh, Judy Dench, Maggie Smith, uh, and a whole slew of other actresses, and they all have this thing in common, which is the power in the voice, uh, which comes from experience and training and genetics. I I would hasten to say Prunella scales as well, um, and. This seems to be a sort of something which is not consciously developed amongst actresses in terms of training. Um, that uh, do you know the actress <coughs> Emma Fielding? Yes, I know her a little bit. I've okay, seen her well, do. I saw her in Twelfth Night. Was she good? Oh yes. Well, Emma was in my year at drama school. And uh, we all we all sort of knew that she was destined for big things, apart from being a, a fine actress. The other reason being is she has one of the most beautiful voices any of us had ever heard. And one of the things that characterized her voice was the range in it. She had this very deep, mellifluous voice, not quite Fenella Fielding. I think I, I think I showed Fenella Fielding to Sumter one day because Fenella Fielding was like the, you know, she had one of those sorts of voices going on like that. Um, and it always struck me as that being one of the things which is sorely lacking. Now you trained you trained in theatre here to a degree. Mm -hmm, of course. Was there any, you know? Yes. Uh, how yes. was it done in relationship to women? Um, <clears throat> not really. Uh, was not a dis. I don't recall like being different from a man than from a woman. We just did exercises. We just you know tried to, to do our best. But uh, for me, it was too focused in the voice. We were worried about the voice. <laughs> And therefore, the voice wasn't really working straight because, you know, we were worried, as you were saying, um, uh, Michael, um, you know, you don't have to think about these things, you, you know, and, and of course, in the training, you are so fixed on to doing something that nothing works. Oh, I became completely obsessed with it when I was in drama school. I, it just became it became all technical because I had I had a very, very strong voice and I had a diaphragm that, you know, you know, could break down doors and that's all it became. So what happened was it was easier to invest in the technicalities of it than to face down the actual acting part of it. Yeah, yeah, that must be a <clears throat> can be a, a door for escaping <laughs> to dedicate yourself into the technique and not to the real thing. I I I, I always find it disturbing because separate the uh, the actual intention from the voice, separate the body from the from the voice. They are things that I think Okay, they work as an exercise, but you know you cannot have two years doing this, you know, because I don't think that that's something that you want to pursue. People they are worried about their voices and their, you know, what I mean, you want them to be to be free, you know, uh, not worried about it. And it was it was very hard all the exercises. I remember um, it was you know, and the teachers were really mean. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm sure you deserved it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, you know, the actor has to do already too many things, you know, to to be worried about their own body. I mean, the body works, the, being also the voice, because you have the purpose of what you're, you know, because you've chosen what you want to say at that moment and everything works because that is, you know, that is, that is a, a natural thing. Like, you know, if we are... Without mics, you know, I would speak uh, to some certain people in a certain distance and it's always accurate because I put my intention there. I, I, I know the person and it's, it's magical, <laughs> you know, if you, if, you, if you think it that way. And if you are in a theater, you know, normally, you know, the, the, the voice goes and reach uh, the people that they are there because 
but you want to. It's one of the things um, when we when we were in Merida, and I think you saw the recording of it, Michael, in the the Roman theater. Um, the acoustic is already broken in the theater because half of the back of the theater is missing. <coughs> There's absolutely no way out of it but to uh, but to amplify it. And this, the the space th there's something missing in the design of the theater there, and it's it's necessary to amplify it. Although I was desperately trying to resist it, and I'm sure if you had a a, a fleet of in incredibly overtrained actors in their voices, you could probably pull it off. Um, one of the th the main problems with the amplification of the voice is you can't tell where the voice is coming from. And this yeah. idea of, of, as you said before, of all being in the same space, this quasi-religious ceremony aspect of, of theater is the first thing that is lost when when the voice is amplified because you don't know where it's coming from. It's just coming from everywhere. Well, I think technique nowadays, um, it, it also bettered a lot. And I think that there is... Technique in what sense? In, in, the, in, the, in the, the actual... The technicalities the of technicalities. it. How it's technically amplified. Yes. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I was discussing that with our... It was very nice and very knowledgeable person in Merida. Mm -hmm. She was saying that, of course, you know, if more money you put into it, <laughs> you can actually, uh, you know... Uh, adjust the thing exactly on, on well, the space. The, 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 the idea being that the where theater. the actor is, where the amplification is coming from, the actor is is relative to where they're standing. So if they're yes. on the left hand side of the stage, the the speakers on that side of the stage will 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 um, will prefer them as opposed to on the other side of the stage. So it's not you're just so somebody will talk and you will look to where they're speaking, which yes. is quite clever. Um, and, but you know you need money for that. You need you know productions that they are big to be able to do it right. You know. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, a, uh, the RSC now they have mics or not? No, I haven't been to the RSC for a few years. Okay. I don't know. They probably do. I know that sometimes at the National Theatre they have, and sometimes they don't. I think it depends on the director, really, what they want. But I, I don't know that exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I will say about the voice that nature will sometimes help you if you can stand back and let it rush in. Not entirely to have a well-trained voice that is warmed up and, and all of that is a very good thing, but you must remember that every baby, no matter how tiny, if they need their mother or their father, you hear them with great ease. <laughs> because they just think what they want and the voice is out. There is exactly. nothing. What happens in life is socially and, <clears throat> and in terms of teaching and in terms of stress and everything else, things take over and alter your voice. No baby is born, first of all, speaking a language. And so all of that, everything is an adjustment. And a lot of people have an idea of how they want to come over and they speak in a certain way. Um, I, I've already talked about a lot of modern actors now who try to talk into their body mic because they think um, that's more realistic because they're not being loud. And you think, well, no, that's as much of a lie as anything else if the person you're talking to is 20 feet away. Talk to the person in the room. Just talk. Make them hear you. Think to them. It's, a lot of it's to do with where you think your voice. If you have a really bad voice that doesn't reach that, probably nobody should have trained you as an actor in the first place. I have to say that. <laughs> but I know very few people that can't be heard on stage. Very few. This, th this, is, an inter this is an interesting thing that you just mentioned. Um, I, I spent a... Um... <laughs> No, 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 no. It's, it's only this one. Huh? No, no, no. I, I no. should have trained. I, I no, amongst uh, no, amongst other things, in, in terms of the thing uh, that I'm countering recently, uh, there are certain forums that I take part in, and with relationship to acting and theatre and everything else. And one of the things that people have been talking about, you're talking about people who have, um, let's just go and say, uh, they don't have uh, either the the physical or mental. <clears throat> um, abilities that everybody else might have and the great complaint is that why can't they make it so anybody can do it and th there's obviously a lot of very politically correct people who are saying yes it should be absolutely everybody should be allowed to do everything all the time if they want to no. that's one thing and the other side is there's a great 
um, um, silence with everybody else who doesn't just just doesn't want to get into it, knowing that that what you go to the theater to see is something extra, exceptional and you know and extraordinary. And the trouble is, is that is that we don't we're not necessarily born as natural theater actors, even though we may have the physical capabilities to actually get there. It's certainly something that needs to we need to learn how to do. The question being is that how much should we let people get away with? I guess that's what I'm saying. Well, so, some of speaking is it is always linked to what you want as a character and how you try to get it by speaking. But also, I have to say, the audience have got to um, want the story to go forward and have got to lean into it. It, it takes both sides to make that work. There is, it, it sort of makes me laugh because of course, Stephen Sondheim wrote a musical called Anyone Can Whistle. Anyone can whistle, that's what they say, easy. Um, watch this, <laughs> see, not everyone can whistle. Mm. <laughs> but no, well, yes they can, but it's, it's a- uh, I, I, I whistle very badly. I'm joking. He is talking about living your life. You, you can find a way to live your life. That's what, it's a metaphor for that. Yeah. And it's a wonderful song. There is a recording of him singing it himself at a piano. It's wonderful. Um, yes, well, that, that, that's all I can say on that. I, I just think hmm. but it, it's <clears throat> essential. I mean, Jean-Louis Barrault, who I mentioned before, used to say, if you, if you can't do anything else, be heard. Otherwise, the play doesn't happen. Yes. <clears throat> Is it, it? I once saw. Um, but, but, I, I once saw a much. I think it was much ado about nothing, or as you like it, um, in a park in Los Angeles. And I have to tell you that the absolute worst actor on the stage was the was the best actor to 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 listen to. Because he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to be clever. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to show off. He just, he was just speaking very, very clearly and being very simple. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting. It's, it's an interesting thing that sometimes the, 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 the most simple and direct thing that somebody's doing will be the one that captures most attention. Yes. Um, yes. <clears throat> well, there is this tradition of doing all this incessant. Um, rehearsals and I think I mean, I mean here in Spain I mean for weeks and months and I think that is awful because um, I've, I've often told people about weekly rep exactly and how that used to work um, in the UK people old actor laddies used to come to our drama school and tell, talk to us about doing weekly rep at Frinton on Sea where they would rehearse one play during the day for a week and then perform a different one at night and then Exactly. No, it's because if you if you are thinking too much on the play, on the words, on the pauses, on the reactions, on the actions, you know, you, you, then you distance yourself about, you know, the first impression that you have when you read it, that is the first impression that the audience is going to have when, you, when they see it. And then it all gets so complex, then, then instead of being, uh, you know, a, 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 a way of joy is is just complicated because you put there all the uh, you know all the hours and the effort that you don't need to. You, I think, you know, I think I like. I, I think sometimes if you do something simple, but we all know people who are trying to make their mark, so they keep giving you notes and wanting this and wanting that and complicating things, and you think that's all very well, but like. Um, we open in 10 minutes. What do I do now? And, uh, yeah. It's, it's one of those peculiar things that it's, for me, it's like trying to, you can establish tactics and strategies. You can, you can establish f formations and, and a rough idea of how you're going to move forward. But when the whistle's blown and everybody goes over the top, it, the best thing you can do is to, is to work out how you're going to control the chaos of, of a live performance. And in that moment, the play doesn't uh, the director's input is is not only irrelevant but it's also <laughs> can be detrimental from there on in 
if yes. they're going to do anything, it's is it's to suggest suggest the things that work well and tell everybody that that <laughs> that it was great. So many times that you know that I've been in sta on stage and I heard the people laughing at something or wanting to have a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that, and the director was not wanting us to do that, you know, and I. This pleasing of the audience is something that some directors don't like. <laughs> I, I've also, but I've also seen plays um, decimated in by the true the, sense by yeah. because the actors are pursuing the laugh that they got the night before. And I know that is something else. I'm not saying no because then you are, you know, you are talking by memory, and that it never works. No, what do you mean by talking by memory? Talking by memory of what I had done yesterday, and I want to repeat it now. No, no, no. And they are not in the moment, and they are not present, and then nothing works. No, no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying. I'm saying you know when the. What the people want is to be entertained, right? And to be <clears throat> amused. Um, also, you know, they are very thankful when you give them things to reflect upon, right? Oh, no, look. This, I, mean, I mean, this is another thing that, that nobody goes to the theatre wanting to be miserable and not be entertained. You, you know, no. every, everybody's desperate to find something to, to chuckle at. Everybody's desperate because we're all in the same space. We're all in the same room. We're desperate to have contact with these people that we see in front of us. We're desperate to to find the thing that we have in common, the thing that makes us laugh, because we're in the privileged position of having of seeing this whole frame, as it were. Well, it's interesting. You have to try really hard to to alienate an audience. audience. No, but it, but it's true that when you are are fixed on doing something or an, or to do a successful thing that you already did, yeah. as you said, then you want to repeat it, and then the the play can be really stretched in a ways that that they are not really efficient. That yeah, is well, I the, the example I give is is um, an old student of ours, Carla Postigo. She she's in the the this, the Spanish version of the play that goes wrong. And she was in the original company and she's been doing it. She's been doing it for years now. And I went to see it. I'd never seen anything like that. It was absolutely hilarious. Uh, sometime I went to see it again um, a few weeks later with the Sumta. Again, it was still hilarious. Then I went to see it again because somebody invited me several years down the line. <clears throat> and the audience found it funny. But the actors had gotten bored and started making stuff up. They were making stuff up and being funny because it had worked other times they'd done it. But what they did is they had systematically undone the fundamental integrity of the dynamic between the characters in the show. No, no, of course, of course. No, no, that is a, it is a danger there, yes. And we all have to be very conscious about that. But one thing is that, and the other thing is not to please the audience. I mean, we have to find a middle way where you know, where, where the thing is right in the moment and and you hear, you know, the audience and you give them what they want, right? Very often, I think an audience will react. I know this sounds odd, but they will react because you tell them to. If you tell them this is funny, they will politely laugh. It's not real, but they will. And they will also tell themselves they had a good time. Hmm. I would say that for the most part, for actors to have favorite moments, and to cling to them is generally a bad idea. Because after all, when you say anything in life, the whole thing that makes something funny, for instance, is its spontaneity. You don't know you're going to say it. You don't know, it's good, and you don't know what's happening. And you have to continue to try to produce that. Absolutely. And you have to do that through some sort of honesty. If you're going on saying, this is my best bit audience, pay attention. And then you give the line, yes, you'll get a laugh, but it's second rate, generally. Absolutely, yes. They are pleasing you instead of uh, pleasing the actor, yeah. instead of, of you know, being pleased by well, the thing that happened. It's, it's very interesting because in terms of stand-up comedy, a stand-up comic's entire shtick is to try and make you think this is the first time they've ever said it. That's mm -hmm. the whole thing. And to make them think that it's just occurred to them to bring this up to you and it's sort of descended from the heavens, this moment of inspiration. The only exception to that particular rule is the sketch by Abbott and Costello called Who's on First Base? Everybody's seen it. 
And the extraordinary thing, if you look look for Evan Costello, who's on first base, if you look for it on, on YouTube, you will find at least six to seven different versions of it done by them. And each one is perfect. And each one is identical, right? <laughs> Including the bit where um, Bud Abbott actually corpses about 80% of the way through it. He gets mixed up and he laughs to himself and the audience laughs with him. Thinking that that was something that Thinking happened. it's a mistake. He mistake. always does it in exactly the same point. He always makes the same mistake. He always makes the same mistake because it's not a mistake. Yeah, of course. It's, it's, uh -huh. it's, um, it's included in there. Like when somebody's making um, a presentation, you look at Steve Jobs doing um, a presentation of a product and Apple back in the day, there's a point when he would stop and go and take a drink of water. Okay, that's a very deliberate thing to reset the audience, recalibrate the audience. The interesting thing with that is they know the jokes. The audience knows the jokes. There's never an acknowledgement that these are jokes. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the audience is treated with the to, to have the intelligence that every audience has. And there's never a moment where it's stopped and said, and they say, this is funny. The trouble is, is when people start trying to hit the joke. Yes. And yes. then what happened? It's one of the problems when you have a play that on the page is hilarious. I mean, it's hilarious. And you are at the read through and everybody is dying laughing. And then you start rehearsing. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get back to that thing that you had when you read it for the first time. I often say that the read through is the greatest state that the play will ever be in. <laughs> it will never get, you know, every, every part of rehearsal is trying to get back there in many ways. Um, but how do you feel, um, Michael, when when you when you have this uh, temptation of going through these moments that you know they're going to work? You know what what do, what do you say to yourself? Um, you know what what is this voice, mental voice? Well, that I, you mean, I, I enjoy the fact that people have enjoyed it before, but I don't think you can ever go on with that notion chucked away into the side of your cheek to say you're going to love this bit watch this bit because you're sure to not get a laugh that night let me go back to the voice that we were talking about a bit and about shouting and the quality of voices nobody likes really to be shouted at including an audience they hate it and a lot of people are not trained very well now and so if they don't have mics, they shout, and it's different than projecting your voice slightly. It just is. Um, but let me take that further into film acting, where we've talked about, you know, a relationship with a camera or something. Do not ever do it for the camera, unless there's a reason, unless they're trying to create something artificial. Stand back open up and let the camera come inside you. That's all you can do. But think the thoughts. You can't, you can't be fake. You can't fake that. You have to really think. And think the thoughts and talk to the people in the room and all of that. I think that fact that you're doing it for the camera is a nightmare. And there are people that do that. Mm. And it signals that they think they're funny or sad or good looking or something that you think I, I could do without this. I could make up my own mind as an audience member, but I think just get on with it. Um, I think that's all I have to say about that. It's interesting you say that. It's something that we've been saying for a long time when we came up with a, a great way of illustrating it is that acting in the theater is convex, i.e. you reach them. And acting on camera is concave in the sense that the camera steps inside is you accept that attention and it comes to you um, that there's a simple trick what what i've done working with actors who come from theater and you put them on camera and all of a sudden it's like some how are you? you know the voice is supported and it's very well produced but it's entirely inappropriate for the space that it's taking place in the first the thing camera i do is then recording a, a bad theater performance that's what the camera is recording in that case it's ex exactly um, yes, but most, most, but but yes, but sometimes there is there is just um, a heightened a heightened position that that the actors put themselves when they act, and that yes, comes yes. that it comes from from the training, the theater training. 
It's yeah. it's a little bit like when you see young actors doing their first walk on role in Casualty. Um, they're doing all the right things, and consequently, you're, they're sort of doing everything wrong. Um, because what they're doing is that they can be heard, their diction is clear. You know, they're they're physically doing all the correct things, but you're just going, oh my god, you just you're just a drama student, you know, because what 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 they're doing is all the right thing, all the right things, but it's the right things in the wrong place in many in many ways. Um, the solution that I have for actors who are in that kind of vocal space is I take them to a very small room, a very small room. We used to have a little makeup room in our school, which was about a meter by two and a half meters. And if it was a scene or whatever it was, I'd say, all right, give me the text, say what you're going to say. And they would immediately find it. They wouldn't be able to produce the voice in the same way. They would, you would just be two people speaking. And I go, okay, do you hear how that sounds? And they'd be like, yeah. I said, okay, so that's it. The other thing I would do is that I would put the headphones on the actor. So when we put the microphone close to them, they would hear how sensitive it was. And they would realize mm -hmm. that they didn't have to do all the things that they'd been doing since they were trained to do it. Um, it's one of those things, when I went to drama school, nobody ever talked about it. Nobody ever mentioned it. it they, the training always only ever went in one direction, was to fill that space. It never contemplated the moments where you didn't have to fill that space. Or rather, that space would fill you, mm -hmm. as it were. But um, yes, but those are diff diff is 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 normal. You know, sometimes the people just put the the, the hat of oh, I'm in a theater. Oh, I am in a in, in film school. Oh, I'm a you know, and it's is is you know, you, it's better to be without hats. <laughs> but but sometimes you cannot because your your you know is your habit is is where you where you you know you you had learned how to. Uh, produce everything. Well, it's like it's like the other thing. Uh, the the thing that occurred to me the other day. Another way to see it metaphorically is is that uh, it depends on how big the pool is. The stage is a much much bigger pool to swim in that needs b bigger strokes and 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 you know more effort to get from one side to the other than than you have when you're in a close up. Well, it's also is 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 clear that when, when because we don't have uh, uh, you know film acting school still very well developed. The, the the people the people that they are from the first time in a in a space that is they don't know anything about how that works and of course they you know they go back into into uh, the reality that they know which is okay I'm acting for a theater hmm. it's not that it's very different you know but 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 it is it, there are certain techniques that it is going to harm you Oh, I, I wanted to ask you because something. It's, it's something. You're going to be distanced, you know, from mm. from you. You you are not going to be able to to speak truthfully mm -hmm. uh, because you have this idea of a theater. You don't think so, Michael or Scott? I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we 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 were we were looking at the things. We were talking about this before we b b before we went live. This idea of of presence and in charisma. Do you think there's a there's something that connects the people who who whether on stage or camera where they they have a sort of um, there's a thread that connects them they have something in common that makes them charismatic or or enhances their presence in any given way? Uh, no, I, I just think that some people have it and some people don't. It's a bit like talent. I think you're born with it. I don't think you necessarily know you have it. People, more people would know they have talent and they would therefore develop it. You can't do a thing with charisma. Charisma is that thing that makes you a leader. It's that thing that makes everybody in the room want to follow you and, and you know, hmm. um, La sign La over all their papers to you and everything else. And, and, and it's partially to do with sex and sexuality and sex appeal sometimes sometimes it's just to do with thought or it's just that you like the face or or whatever it is um and it's a great thing it's what kind of makes a star and people don't like to believe in stars but there are stars i mean i know that that stanislavski used to write that there uh, well i don't know whether he wrote it personally or whether People at, you know, the actor studio in New York used to say there is no such thing as a small part. There are only small actors. You have to kind of... 
define that. What that really means is don't play your part as though it's not important because they all are in whatever way. It might be a small part, don't overplay it, but treat it absolutely seriously. Give it the background you need in order to perform it. Um, don't insist on attention if it's not that kind of person. But I'm here to say there are small parts because before Stanislavski, there was classical drama, there is Shakespeare, and there are small parts in Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. There really are. I probably played the smallest ever. It had two words, and the words were, he did. <laughs> the only line I had. And it was the second murderer in Richard II. And um, I have a friend who jokes at me because I did way, 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 way too much and paused a great deal on he did. It was a, a torture. It was a sort of one act track. But, you know, that's me. He did. And you think that's a small part. But, but also, I once played a very small part in Bulgakov's Moliere, the prompter in Moliere's theatre company. Not a very big part. But you also get, I mean, it was a wonderful director, um, who, the sort of director who thinks that you have to have words with every single actor in the room so that they feel that they're paying attention to you and that they care about what you do. And all that's really fine, except I had a line when Molière was having a breakdown. I run in having heard a commotion from outside and I say, what's going on? And this director said to me, my nickname is Fitz, Fitz, what do you think the prompter means when he says, what's going on? And I said, I assume he wants to know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and what did he say? I think at that moment he decided never to work with me again. I think a lot of people are like it. <laughs> Just to, you know, that one is a smart ass. Don't hire him again, you know. Yes. Um, never be a smart ass. Never be a smart ass. It's, it's like that idea of, I don't know, what, what, what is a good length of rehearsal, do you think, for a play? I think these things differ. The, the Moscow Arts used to spend one or two years doing something. I think that's a tad excessive. However, mm -hmm. it depends on who's leading the rehearsals. If you know what you're doing and you know what you have to get through and what you have to get everybody through and the difficulty of the play. Um, as a rule of thumb, when I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1980, you had eight weeks to do a play. In rep, you had three weeks. And I have a, a rule, which is, if you're having a terrible time and you need to get out of something, uh, I, I will not leave a production within its final three weeks, because I think that's the least amount of time somebody else has to get it together to make it all work. If I'm having a terrible time, I will not leave a production. If, if I'm really, and I never have left a production, but you do think about it all the time, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Taxi, um, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of those things. It's somebody somebody was uh, asked me, I said, uh, they, were, they were talking about a play, and they said, well, I'm really not sure about it. And I said, well, don't do it. And they go, well, why? I said, well, if you have these doubts before you've even started, it's going to get even worse. It's not going to get mm. better. If you already have these these clear and present doubts, that when you get, when it kicks off, the, the, you'll be there for five minutes going, "Why didn't I agree to do this?" <laughs> yeah, you know? of course. But that's got to do with the fact that I have done that myself. I've gone, "Why?" Well, you know, "All right, I don't want to do this, but I'll do it." And then five minutes later, you know, five minutes later, <laughs> you're like. I really shouldn't have done that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I've accepted things because I wanted to do them, but it, they were a mistake. They were a mistake. <clears throat> um, I feel about people speaking verse, I, I think I've said this before, it's a bit like being a jazz singer. You either have jazz in your body or in your voice or in your mind or in your rhythm, definitely, or you don't. 
or, or if you do ballet, you have extension instead of jazz. Um, I'm joking slightly, but I mean, I remember <laughs> seeing Imelda Staunton in Richard Eyre's production of Guys and Dolls. And she was in a chorus line of all the, ha the um, what were they called? The hot box girls or the, something like that, yes. I think it was hot box. I can't remember what they're called. And everybody else was a trained kind of dancer. They had uncertain rhythm. They certainly didn't have a downbeat. And Imelda Staunton, who was shorter than most of them, had absolute music in her body. And she's the one you looked at. That's it. She had it. Mm. And you can either speak first or you can't. You can talk. You can learn lines. I know people that have tried and tried and tried. And you have it by nature. That doesn't mean that you don't have to work at it. The more talent you have for anything, the more you really should probably work on it. <clears throat> I think. Yes, it develops, it gets bigger, it gets, it gets more understanding <clears throat> to you, and it gets, you know, it gets also more enjoyable for the others because, you know, you know exactly why. But that, I, 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 I'm not agree with you, I think, with this thing of charisma. I think that there is, a, there is things that one can do to improve a person's charisma because... I, I've seen people some to pretend to have charisma mm -hmm. and they do get attention but it's not the same thing. It's pretend. Yeah. And I find it quite irritating. Well, I think, well, what else are they supposed to do? They haven't got any charisma, so they're but, coming but, up again. But, but yeah, but you see, I saw, I mean, I think that was um, the movie I did with the, the French person, Les Mille uh, Une Nuit, the, the, the 100,000 Nights with this, uh, uh, with Agnès Varda? With Agnès Varda, yes. Um, so Agnès Varda, Agnès Varda did this, this movie, uh, Celebration of Cinema, the 100 Years of Cinema, and, and you know, it, it put everyone in a room, a lot of actors and actresses that we were in, we were in Hollywood. And, and so I, I had the opportunity, we had the opportunity to, to be there with some people. And I remember, I don't know if it was Brad Pitt or the other one. Anyway, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Brad Pitt. Or the other one. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure. What's the other one? Um, yeah, the one that uh, Mr. Bourne or Bourne. Oh, Matt Damon. Matt Damon. One of those. Matt Damon. Yes. And so I remember like looking at them and saying, wow, you know, these people got something. And the people, and then I started to go with them, you know, it says like, okay, so what you're doing or whatever, whatever. And it was like, zzz, nothing. So I said, oh, why? So is is also what the people project on you that it gives you something, you know, like sometimes yes, like you know. The, the, so there is a kind of a mystery in, mm -hmm. in the in the charisma thing. I think you're talking about Stephen Dorff. Or what was Stephen Dorff? Yes, Stephen Dorff, who was quite hot at the time. There's a certain something when when somebody becomes um, well known, when their face becomes notorious, there is something which is. Uh, when you see them, it's it's touching something in your memory or your relationship to that image quite deeply. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that it becomes like putting a microphone next to an amplifier. Because you, what you do is you have a kind of feedback effect. The more you see them, the more you... And then what you do is you're shocked to see them in three dimensions for the first time. Yes, yes. That's the when I saw <clears throat> Tom Cruise, uh, you know, in real life, I was like, oh my God, he exists in three dimensions because you've only ever seen this man in, two. you know, in two dimensions before. So I understand what you're saying is is that that notoriety or being known will garner yes. attention and that attention will increase your charisma whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. And more than that is that when you are, um, of course, uh, I, I cannot put them, my hand on the fire and, and understand if they knew it or not. But one of the things that, that all of them had, you know, is, is the... Um, is is that I I put on them some kind of a secret. So uh, for me, uh, you know, the the charisma has to do also with something that the people really don't. Well, it's got to do with our advice. If you're going to have your picture taken, yeah. and I I learned that I learned this through I think it was Nick Moran who told me that was something that Michael Feast used to say. I don't know if you've ever worked with Michael Feast. 
but but Michael Feast uh, famously would look at himself before he went on stage, and and this is completely apocryphal. I have no idea whether this is true at all. Look at himself and say, "I am beautiful, and I have a secret," um, <laughs> which I think is brilliant. <laughs> and if you're ever in front of a camera and somebody's taking you know taking pictures of you, thinking, "I am beautiful, and I have a secret." Is a pretty good place to start. <laughs> no, no, no it, it, it's mystery, is what that is, mystery, and that yes. doesn't people look at you. But also another thing that they had, and I think that is something that they do, for instance, on the Alfombra Roja, how you say that, the red, red carpet. carpet. The red carpet is that they were accepting the looks, accepting that, yes. they, that they were there and the people were somehow interested on them and he they feel it did they f they they were feeling it and they were just accepting it with grace yeah the greatest version of the of don juan i ever se i've ever seen uh, was by the georgian film actors company and i saw it in scotland and it was all in georgian right and part of the play is there's a prompter who sits underneath the stage when their head is just shown and they were explaining what's going on and it opened with blaring gershwin jazz and um, Don Juan and his pal came out. They just fought and killed the captain. And Don Juan, they just sauntered out onto the stage and Don Juan was taking off his gloves and looking at everybody and accepting their attention mm -hmm. and looking at the pretty girls in the audience and sort of, That's you know, saying, you know, I'm available afterwards sort of thing. <laughs> and what it was, was, was the, the, it immediately established the yes. the bravura the, the 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 charisma of this particular man see that was something i also saw in uh, avignon with um with the director peter brook <clears throat> with uh, the, the a lot of actors of peter brook had that this 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 confidence of just being there by just being in the present and, it's it and, and open themselves to to the look to the to the insight so let, let them then come to you it's it's a little bit like what uh, john malkovich spending the first five minutes of a play with his back to the audience exactly it's the same thing you know uh, a friend, and i think you can cultivate that a little bit you but know? The, the other side is that a friend of mine went to see charlton heston doing a man for all seasons in newcastle mm -hmm. and he said the play starts and then sometime afterwards charlton heston comes in and he said when he walked on stage the audience erupted into applause and he walked to the front of the stage and he took a bow and then he got on with it <laughs> yeah, <good. laughs> i'm not quite sure how i feel about that but they were going to see a man for all seasons because i had charlton heston in it i mean of let's course, let's be course. serious about of it of course of course so you know i think it's nice you know you you just you know say thank you and you get on with life <laughs> yeah, i suppose <laughs> no I don't know. I think Michael, that the the the, the actor charm, of course, is is as you say, uh, not to not to be something that you know that you are that you think all the time or that you, but it, but it's interesting to feel when when you know well this 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 kind of poise when 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 you are in these situations where you are looked upon, and I think the actor is all the time like that, no? Because well, he's acting a character, but you know everybody's there also. Um, no, well, no. It, it's it, it's 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 very interesting. The, the, the other so you thing, have to accept that. The other accept the other thing I'd have to say is that there are people like Christian Bale who are technically extraordinary actors, but they are they're 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 they they don't have the natural charisma. Yes, that other people have. Yes, and then there's people who don't have that much technique or or perhaps talent, if we want to call it that, who do have it. Yeah, um, it has to be to do something with effort, also, Michael. When 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 you see too much effort, then you dista distance yourself. No, and at least uh, yes, yes. Now I don't know. Perhaps in the nineteenth century, where you know all this grandiose way of saying things was also the virtuoso, uh, you know, and it was really something that people could praise. But right now. We, I, th I don't think you know. Uh, well, that that's interesting to see how how where are we now? No, where where really is what 
what the people is you know is authenticity well it's is it's it's something that that we were ta- talking about o- offline some some time ago which is the idea that there seems to be an effort to deconstruct the classics and um stomp all over the things that have worked for 500 years but particularly in relationship to shakespeare mm-hmm. that that the the director I, I think it is not so much love of that classic that they're producing it is love of themselves producing <laughs> absolutely yeah. yes everybody wants to make their mark that is understandable but of course that's destructive but it's also in the air uh, uh, the culture that we have everybody's yeah. worried about how they look in themselves uh, no it's like some isn't it funny because half the time now i don't remember people's faces we we have more focus on people's faces than ever before there, there's so much in film and things it's not the amount that often they choose faces you just i don't remember them as far as the foyer after the show and I can't really, I can sort of remember. I mean, I'm quite bad. I'm one of those people that never, never follows a plot. I'm looking at other things or taking things in. And I mean, that's... Oh, that's interesting. What do you, what you're looking at? Well, that's stupidity. I mean, people say, what happened? I says, I have no idea, but it looked like this and so-and-so was good and so-and-so was bad and whatever. So you're but looking more at the acting. I never, never see a film for the first time for the story. I do, I do sometimes. Mm-hmm. if it's really very good and then of course it's there but often no <laughs> but i don't remember a lot of people's faces i think maybe faces are becoming incredibly homogenized and so they're all like i i I, I, w- I would suggest it also has to do with the fact that there are just more faces and also maybe and also the also the price of entry has been severely reduced in terms of uh, very often these it's some to take a a, a modern example that, that the people watching might might understand a little bit more of what we're saying is for example take something like netflix that has invested something in the region of 14 billion dollars in film and television uh in the last year it might even be more than that and all of the streaming platforms are doing exactly the same thing and what that means is you have people who are creating massive expensive films and television shows that will be consumed and then moved on from um, at a rate which has never ever happened before one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years because of the nature of film streaming the pandemic amongst other things is the idea of the star has sort of disappeared what we have now is we have uh, people who are either consistently competent in what they're doing, uh, which means that they work all the time, or you have new people who have to come in and pick up the slack and play this uh, and play leading roles or important roles in shows where they're unproven, inexperienced, and don't necessarily have the chops, don't necessarily have the, what the people of yesterday had, right? Yesteryear, as it were. So what you're doing is you're dealing with a whole bunch of, as you say, homogenized faces, talents, characteristics, etc., etc., which means everybody's sort of like, sort of disappearing. But, but homogenized, I don't know, because, you know, now that I'm looking to all these Indian movies or, you know, the Taiwan or, you know, if Netflix is offering us all this diversity of that we never dreamt to have. But before. there's one thing that you and I have experienced when we're watching uh, Indian movies, the Bollywood movies, it's particularly the ones from the last five years, is they're movie stars. Absolutely. They are complete movie stars. Yes, yes, they know yes. what they're doing. They are beautiful people. They're shot to be to look even better. You know, they can't make a cup of tea without it going into slow motion and the <laughs> and the audi you know and the orchestra swelling. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. You know, whatever they're doing, it's like they go to bed wearing sunglasses. I mean, they're just so cool. But I mean, there is many, no, Michael. There is too many to remember them yes but i don't think it's the numbers i mean i i can look at a face solidly and go uh -uh." i mean there are some very 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 famous people i won't name them because it would be insulting but you think i can't remember what they look like really it's not always important of course because there are many people in life if you're if you're doing something that is completely natural to life but you see sometimes it might be just a stage we're going through. Sometimes 
you need things to be heightened and that's what we can do. We can, through intensity and through focus, we can make things memorable and we can make them slightly, it doesn't matter that they're real or not, I, I don't mind if it's a fantasy, I don't mind whatever it is, um, um, or if it's the equivalent, today's equivalent of a kitchen sink drama. That's a very odd thought because there are some very highfalutin kitchen sinks these days. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I don't. Some people say, well, so, oh, there are exceptions, of course. You do remember a lot of people's faces. I mean, you, you, if you name the name and you, you know who the actor is, you think you want to know what they look like. There are some people who can say, I just think, I don't know, I can't remember what they look like. And it's more recent that that happens to me. And I don't, it could be just numbers, but then I don't watch a lot of the things that people watch. So I don't have huge exposure. Mm -hmm. But I, I know that when somebody comes onto the stage, for instance, as opposed to film, the camera does the focusing for you in a, in a film. But on stage, somebody comes on and they've got a very important role and I find that, that I'm finding it far easier to watch somebody over there because there's nothing there. I mean, they're a good actor. You wouldn't complain about their acting. It's really worked on and it, it's fine and it's filling the requirements and there are more interesting people like, over there. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that's charis that is slightly what charisma is. I, I think it's when somebody comes on, you go, wow, who's that? Hmm. And you watch them. Um, is it to do with suddenly, is it why you fall in love with somebody when they come into the room and somebody else? Sometimes it's something to do with that. Yes, but not, not, not always, because not the person no. who is more extroverted or, or the, the people that, the, the person that everybody wants to follow is is actually the person that it yeah. has you know well that that, that that's why that's why theaters across the world are filled with people who are known from from tv or movies or whatever because at least yeah. you can remember at least you can remember one person who was in the show uh -huh. no it, it, it's uh -huh. it's just the way it's brand recognition it's, it's people going to see something that they've already seen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the equivalent of comfort food in one way or another, except you get to see it live, you know? I mean, you get to, you get to be in the same room yes. with the person. And, um, I mean, I've, I remember going to see uh, When She Danced with Vanessa Redgrave and Michael Sheen. Yes. And uh, Vanessa Redgrave was extraordinary. You know, no surprises there. But at that time, nobody knew who Michael Sheen was. But you watched it and you went, who the heck is he? He's fantastic, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he was he was up against some heavy, you know, some big guns, you know, with Van Red, you know. And you know the, those those people emerge. That's the thing is they emerge. The thing is they're quite unusual. They are unicorns. They don't happen very often. Yes, but for instance, I I I was thinking while you were also talking, Scott. You weren't listening to me. I see. No, no, okay. yeah, 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 no, no. no. <laughs> what, what was the charm of the three of us, for instance? Yeah. I think Michael has a has a very distinctive intelligence, and that you can see on his eyes, that makes you immediately think, "Wow, this person has a lot more than he's not saying in there." You know, it, it's something I, I don't know. You know, is 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 something that the way he looks at you, or the way he he's thinking. You know, you always feel that there is a lot going on on his head, and that is his charisma, I think. Yeah, the, but one of, one of the great tragedies is very very seldom will people who are um, brilliant, interesting, witty, funny, original in real life will have the opportunity to play a character that's written. Yes. Uh, as witty, funny, brilliant, and yes. and charismatic <laughs> in fiction. It, well, sometimes yes, yeah, sometimes there is things. There, well, it, are, there are, are there not? There are surprises for all of us, I, I, I think. You, you can look at some people and you can think, no, oh, they're good, they're good. And then one day, some role comes along. It may not be in anything absolutely great, but one of those mainstream things. And they absolutely take your breath away. And it is the role for them. And, I, you know, I think... 
I think Peter Brook used to believe that. He, he used to treat all actors that somewhere there is a role that is you that you can play better than anybody else, and he believed that. Mm -hmm. And he had a whole company of actors like that. No, you can't always pick the right plays for everybody, but you don't know what's going to happen. Do you can you can you think of any anyone off the top of your head that that surprised you all of a sudden to see them in something and go, oh my god, I never I never thought thought that of them. Two actors that I work I was just thinking about it this week. Two actors that I've worked with in at the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1982 and 83. They're both in, very good actors. And they were of immense use to the company. And they may not have played the lead, but they were quite young actors at the time. And they played demi-leads. They were sort of, you know, more leading than I was. I was a baby. And one is David Troughton, mm -hmm. son of Patrick Troughton, who was Doctor Who. And you were, who was Wellington and, when you did Sharp? Ah, yes. Very nice person. And... Then there, what, there is Penelope Beaumont. Now, they were both in A Midsummer Murders, different episodes. But I'd watched both of them, and I'd always said, oh, they're very, very good. They're very, very good, you know. There is an episode, I think it's called, I'm not sure, Written in Blood, in which David Troughton plays a drama teacher who I can't remember what happens, but he is excruciatingly embarrassed by members in his class. And it's partly to do with possibly an affair, possibly something that shouldn't have happened or whatever. And I don't remember the plot, as I tell you, I don't follow plots. And it was one of the most moving, extraordinary performances I have ever seen or ever will. And the same with Penny Beaumont. She was in something called for Midsummer Murders, the title was Dead Man's Eleven, and she played this housekeeper. Small, slightly um, rural accent, I can't remember what it was. Sort of sweet, mouse-like, and I know I'm wrecking the plot for people, but she murdered. And you see that really true thing about often people that feel like they're overlooked or that somebody loves somebody else instead of them or, or whatever makes them feel small and that's when they strike and she murdered and the violence in the bludgeoning that you watched her do and the hatred coming out of this tiny butter wouldn't melt in her mouth person was just the scariest thing I've ever seen. It made Betty Davis look like the good fairy, really. <laughs> she was just brilliant. And um, yeah, things like that. Well, it's a similar area that Imelda Staunton, when she went in and did a, did a production of Sweeney Todd, the, the Sondheim musical. And she played Mrs. Lovett, very unlike Angela Lansbury. She, what she really played was you suddenly saw that this is the person that actually leads this story. She's the... Sweeney Todd is mad. He's mad already through emotional um, problems and things that have happened to him in life and being downtrodden and being sent to Australia uh, at the time that they sent people there when they were convicts and he comes back and he wants revenge, but he's mad. Once you're mad... There is no development. He does kill people, but there's no development. She fell in love with him, probably always was in love with him, and she works things out. And it's that thing of however unreasonable the person is being, <clears throat> they're in love. And they will stop at nothing. Even if they're stupid, they will stop at nothing. And that makes them incredibly dangerous. And Imelda did much the same sort of thing. It is, it's the best I'll ever see that role played. Um, I actually think you and I saw that uh, at the National Theatre. Did she do it at the National Theatre? No. Well. Originally. No, I think it might have been Chichester, and then she did it in the West End at the Adelphi. I'm trying to remember because it's one of, one of the few musicals I can tolerate. 
and uh, we saw at the National Theatre. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a play. It's very interesting because it's 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 a play. It's a play about um, madness, really. External okay. madness, internal madness. People true. made mad. But it's true what you say when you play the result. Oh, he's being mad. When people understand that he's mad, you lost everything. <laughs> well, the, the other. Then, the other thing is quite. The other right? thing is that people forget that the Sweeney Todd. If you don't know what the heck it's about, is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. But that is also in on the thing that you play. I mean, it's almost an entire uh, episode where it's all about mystery. Who is he? What, what is he thinking? Um, uh, you know, and, and and that is already from the play. But also, you know, that you don't let anything. Um, um, how you say go escape uh, escape exactly mm -hmm. escape yeah. you know and you and you dosify very well and the director too the in the script the um the actually you know when when you give this pistas how you say this clues this clues to the audience and that is very nice to watch when when there is there is no um no immediate um result when there is this uncertainty no when the, you then is when you of course grab the audience it's it's very <clears throat> it's very interesting you're talking about there's absolutely nothing more wonderful than seeing an actor in their element doing something that you absolutely you could because f you get the chance to if you get a chance to call them up or see them to go that was i mean and it's completely authentic it really highlights all the re all the inauthenticity that we normally bring to any kind of compliment. It's well, such a wonderful well, none thing. Of us, none of us, some people think they know what they should play. I always used to think I knew what I should play. I have never once been taken for a job that I wrote to them or spoke to them and said, I, would you think of me as such? No, never. They would never take... They, no, no, actors always think they can play anything they think. And then, then no, no, we won't see him for that. And you think, well... Yeah. And maybe they're right, but you don't know what people see you as. People, I mean, people have been very flattering to me in my time, very, very good friends. One person says, and it's a great gift, he says, one never knows what you're going to do. And you think, well, that's great. Yeah. That's great if you think that. I do, however, know what I'm going to do because I rehearsed. Hmm. I know the end, do you know, and I know what <laughs> I have to get to. But... That's a great thing for somebody to say. And you think, well, you just, you never know. And therefore, in a way, uh, to, for everybody out there in actor land, never give up. Because you probably do know somewhere, you have an inkling for something you can play. I do generally know if I can play something. And I can probably play quite a lot of things. Whether I'm the best person for it is another question. Probably often I'm not, but I could have a go. One of, one of the things about me is that I'm a character actor, which doesn't mean anything. And then somebody says, ah, oh, but sometimes you're both a leading actor and a character actor at the same time. Well, good. But I try, you know, I try not to know who I am too much. I, I try, and therefore I am uncertain when I sometimes do things. It's not that I don't think I can do the job. It's just that I don't know which way it will go. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what you see in me. I, I leave it, I have to leave it to the audience or the director or whoever, uh, what they see in me. I can't tell them what they should see in me. Of A lot of actors try to do that and it really puts people off. See, yes. It's interesting because I remember seeing David Troughton on stage. Uh, I was just looking at where I saw him. I saw him doing playing Hector in Troilus and Cressida, at the RS. I bet that was. Yeah, he was. He he, he was. I, I I'm trying to work out who it was that played Ulysses. I think it was. I want to say. Is there Paul Jessen? Yeah, Paul Jessen, yeah. which was fabulous. Kieran Hines played uh, Achilles, um, and. Um, <laughs> Rafe Fiennes played Troilus. Um, that's when I first, it really first. Was that Amanda Root as Cressida? Um, I saw Amanda Root um, doing it. I, I've got the original, the original program here. Uh, Linda Kerr Scott was was apparently the 
the original one, but I saw Amanda Root doing it, and she was uh, she was fabulous, if, as far as I can remember. Yeah, well, the, um, the sword fighting was awesome. It was fabulous sword fighting. It was really, really exciting. Troilus and Cressida is funny because it's like a part one. It's missing a part two, really. Yeah, maybe we should write that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really missing the second. What half. you wanted to say, Michael? But, no, but I wanted to say that's oh. when it occurred to me that Ray Fiennes sounded exactly like Leonard Rossiter. And often he looks like him. There's a, there's a, he's either that or he is one of those paintings of Christ where the light shines out of the face. He has that kind of face. The light shines out of it. Makes but it very beautiful. I'd, I, I always read, the, the, the dreadful spot with Cedric into the connotative carbon. Yeah, it was Leonard Rossiter, who was an amazing actor, right? An extraordinary yeah. actor. He was very famous for a sitcom in the 1970s called Rising Damp where he played a horrible landlord. And, every, you know, and he was always trying to get get one over on everybody else, but everybody got one over on him at the end of the day. But he had this very particular way of speaking, which is not a million miles away from from uh, from um, Ray Fiennes when he gets going. Anyway, I just I just remember seeing that. I actually saw it in, I saw it in, on tour in, when it was on tour in Newcastle, oddly enough. Yes. Um, but I think we can pinpoint the charm and the presence of every of every person. Uh, I, I think it's interesting just to know, just to know where are you, where you dance the best. No, I think it's interesting for actors to see, yes, to develop or to try to, you know. I think, for instance, the charm of you, Scott, is uh, you know on the intelligent remarks on the on also the uh, you know the the, the um, amount of knowledge that you have about a lot of things that makes you very uh, charming. Yeah, but but you know. No, that that's true. Because I'm a smarty pants? Yes, you are a smarty pants. Okay, You've ever been <laughs> since you were a child. Your grandfather told me so. Well, then I was, <laughs> no, I think he called me a smart arse. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, no, I always had a, a capacity to retain information, I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's like, uh, as Ellie van der Missen Sombrev says, it's also true that it's difficult to find people who have something interesting to say. <laughs> that Ellie, Th yes. That's one of the biggest crimes uh, when people are boring. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie well, says. Yes. And it says B T W. I don't know what. That by the means. way, of some. Oh, by the way. Welcome to the internet. Okay. By the way, I'm still waiting the red link to watch Borgias. I don't know when you can when when one can see the Borgia. Um, I just, Borgia. don't worry, Ellie. I'll tr I'll track it down and uh, I'll share it with you. What can I say? You know. I don't remember. I don't know. Bor where Bor you can Borgia's track it never. Down. It's interesting. Sharp has never been seen here in Spain. No. And Borgia was on on a an obscure channel here for about 10 minutes two things that they happened uh, i mean the third season happens entirely in spain and yet the spanish had nothing to do with it and sharp also is the the spanish war yep so spain had nothing to do with it it's, yeah exactly well it's there, there was a a, hist a spanish historian who who said we we did a, a screening of one of the sharp episodes in a film festival in astorga in the north of spain and he said i went to foils in charing cross road and i went to the section on the the, the peninsula war as it's called in the uk <laughs> or the independence war as it's called here and he said i saw there was four enormous bookcases filled with books on the subject back in spain it has one shelf and it's half empty this is the 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 real difference between how we feel about Spanish history yes, yes, and how yes. you feel about Spanish history. Yeah, well, I this particular. Uh, well, it's because there was British people saving exactly, you from the, from exactly, the dreadful exactly. Frenchie. That's you like that. <laughs> did you, you know he did sharp? He did sharp, yes, but the, we never can say. Was it afterwards, right? After I was there and you were there, no? Or I can't remember the year, but you don't need to see me do it. <laughs> okay. It's, it's the lost episode. I'm really terrible. Really, 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 truly, truly embarrassing. <laughs> no, I don't believe you. And what did we learn from that, Michael? Don't put Michael Fitzgerald in Sharp ever again. I think that's what we learned. But I think there's very little chance of that now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's the only Note thing you learned. Note to self, don't put Michael Fitzgerald <laughs> in Sharp ever again. But it's no. it's interesting when we do something which is rubbish. Yeah, yeah. Then yeah. we watch ourselves and we do something that's rubbish. I have also a lot of them. Uh, oh god, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing about going to see a friend's movie and it really doesn't work. 
It's another thing when you're going, going to see your own movie and it really doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and you're like, oh God, what do I do? Because I know what I think of it and I, I know nobody wants to say the same thing to me. Yeah, but the, the last thing I remember that I didn't like myself in was Bernarda. <sighs> That's Ooh. really bad. Yeah. <laughs> That was done in 2017, not so far ago. It's also when you hear people <laughs> laughing and you know it wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> awful, awful. It's anyway. a shame because just a little tweak and you could have made it, you could have deliberately made it funny. Yes. But the fact that it was, it was. It was not meant to. You know, it's like um, somebody told me that they saw Peter O'Toole doing Macbeth and he ran, there was a point where he had to run to the front. I think it was, it might have been Macbeth or Hamlet. I can't remember. It was something extreme. And he ran to the front of the stage, right? And his way. And he got to the front of the stage and he stopped. And it was sort of ridiculous. And somebody in the front row just snickered. They just kind of went, <coughs> and he went, uh, piss off. And just walked <laughs> off stage. <laughs> um, dear. It's like the, the, the famous old Ralph <laughs> Richardson story. It's stopping in the middle of of halfway through the first act of a of a dreadful play and announcing to the audience, "Is there a doctor in the house?" And somebody at the back of the <laughs> audience goes, "I'm a doctor." And he goes, "Doctor, isn't this play awful?" And then he gets back on with it. <laughs> I wouldn't dare to do that. I wouldn't. Well, I mean, yeah, th these things happen on Wednesday matinees, I suppose. What's the what's the longest run you've ever done of a play, Michael? Um, I've never really done a really really long run like in the West End. I think I did Anuis Beckett for about three months. But I, I was a bit like you're in plays at the Royal Shakespeare Company for two years, but you don't play every night. Mm. So you play and you play other things in between. I think. I've been quite lucky. I mean, I've never been, well, yes, I have sometimes been bored doing things, but but not very much. I'd be pretty lucky. I've, I can't remember how long we did Donkey's Ears. That was quite six months or something. You I did it for donkey, donkey, Donkey's Ears. Uh, did, did you, did you, did you ever, um, did you ever find yourself, um, your mind begin, your, your mind began to start playing tricks on you? No, no, you never got to that stage. No, people, people always used to say at the RSC that you, you forget which play you're in, you start to spout different Shakespeare. And I thought, no, it's like cooking. It's all cooking. But you know whether you're doing, you know, rice or spaghetti that night. You do. You know which one you're doing. Yes. And then you're on stage cooking spaghetti and then somebody <laughs> reminds you that you're doing Coriolanus. That it isn't Edward de Filippo. No, it's Shakespeare, yes. What's, 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 what was that? Okay, let's leave it there. It's 9.30. It's 9.30. Uh, I have to remember everybody. Uh, look, here, here's, a, here's a question from Lorena. Look, she asks... Ever lost yourself in a role's intensity in theatre or movie? Also, do you find comedy roles more intense than dramatic ones? That's asking you, Michael. Lorena, who's in Los Angeles. I don't think I've ever lost myself in a role, no. No. Uh, I'm thinking too much about the beginning, the middle, and the end, and then it ends, and then I go home. Um, what was the second question? Second question is, uh, and do you find comedy roles <clears throat> more intense than dramatic ones? No, but I have this belief that to be funny, you have to be even more honest and more real than even in tragedy. In tragedy, people will sometimes give you the benefit of the doubt, and if you look sad, they'll be sad with you. But in comedy, if they don't believe you, they don't laugh. Dead. Dead, dead. You have to be, I, think it, I think it takes more talent to play comedy. Yes. Than tragedy. I mean, it takes talent to do all of them, but I think comedy is very specific. Well, also yes, comedy, comedy yes. is one of the few things which is actually supposed to have an actual definable result on the audience. You know, you can mm -hmm. make people think about things and make them feel something which is not particularly explicable, but, but laughter. Laughter. It's binary. It's you, either, binary. you either are or you are not laughing, yes. you know. No, that's, it's, that's it's one of those things say. when you see... If you look at Meryl Streep's first attempts at comedy, she's terrible. 
because she's playing comedy or yeah, rather sure. what she thinks is comedy. Jodie Foster did a, a, a film called The Island of Nim, which is a sort of uh, light comedy and she's dreadful because she's doing comedy acting, which is shocking because I remember seeing her in uh, Bugsy Malone and she's 12 years old, but she's playing not only a fully grown woman, but a fully grown woman with sexual experience. It was very disturbing. <laughs> it's No, it's, it, I found the film very disturbing it, as a kid and as an adult because she's acting like a grown up woman. And she's like, you know, she's yeah. like 12, 13 years old. It's very, very strange. I think that's the reason why it happened what it happened to her, right? What? Well, this thing of being pursued by men and being... Abused. Well, you got, yeah, I guess you've got, you know, you've got the guy who shot the president and you've got, um, what do you call it, taxi driver, Martin Scorsese. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of scary. Francisco Peramo says, <clears throat> oh, I never tried to be funny. <laughs> That's not funny. Comedy is a seriously business. It's a serious business. Yeah, it's like a German. Yes, right. A German joke is no laughing matter. Yes, Michael, you've played a lot of comedies, right? Um, yeah, so, some I liked doing them, or I played characters that had like a comic energy, even if I wasn't to get a laugh. But yeah, yeah. Well, look at the face. You're going to laugh, aren't you? At some point. Um, <laughs> I played a lot of comedies, but some of them weren't supposed to be. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, well, I, it's, I, it's that it's that. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Don't expect to get the laugh. Don't just don't do that. Having said that, if you do get a laugh in the theatre, give them time to laugh and don't ride over them with your line. Very interesting. Yes. Yes, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's this thing, it's when it happens, the listening, no? When you know when it's not too much, well, when it's not too little. It. Yeah. Well, the other thing is to say, I mean, I've said this, is <clears throat> it's don't be surprised if they laugh. No. Uh, one, of, one of the great um, complications of doing something which is genuinely funny on the page, something like the importance of being earnest, is that you have to pick the ones that you're going to that you're going to do because the trouble with the importance of being earnest is every single line is a belter they're all funny they're consistently yeah. funny and if you played every if you, if you let the laugh come out on every single line the play would last four hours and, and you know and everybody would just get annoyed with you um it's it's um that's one of the things i did an alan, an alan inkborn play sisterly feelings some 30 years ago uh -huh. and one of the problems with alan inkborn is he writes he writes funny on the page, it's funny. You read it out loud for the first time, and it's hilarious. The trouble is, you lose your way as you lose you lose track of why it was funny, and you start trying to make it funny. And of course, you you're killing it. You're absolutely killing it because you're trying to make it, and it's already funny. You, but, but th you just have to turn up. Those are very funny challenges for oneself as an actor, you not know, to try to be on top of this and not be like that and. Try to. I think that that is our our job is what it makes our our job interesting. Well, part part of the thing, and I think it's what you, what what Michael was saying about about comedy and tragedy is that the comedy of it. it if if you're in any, if you're in any doubt as to making it funny, lean into the tragedy of it, and the yes. comedy will hopefully reveal itself. <laughs> Everybody just wants to see. It's like Mel Mel Brooks said. He said, um, "Tragedy is me cutting myself shaving. Comedy is watching you fall into a huge hole in the middle of the street." Who it's all that? Mel Brooks. That along with try to get some rest and I'll check the perimeter as being the two greatest lines in scripts ever that he never understood. Try to get some rest. I'm going to go check the perimeter. I don't understand that neither. Because there's such cliches. <laughs> it's like, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here, check the perimeter, try to get some rest. I don't see it. I don't, I don't understand it. They're, they're completely cliched lines that people say in movies all the time that don't really mean anything. Uh-huh. Okay. And that is funny. It's funny when somebody points out, when it's Mel Brooks pointing, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's why you have to spend, uh, you know, I spent the last 30 years with me because obviously I make a day go easier. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you know? Well, Michael, thank you for making us uh, these two hours easier also. <laughs> Almost thank two you. hours. What's extraordinary oh, is that you can, because of the internet, you can find anything ever. 
it's it's all there it's uh, when i found all your um your your theater credit um i didn't know these resources existed somebody's retroactively gone back and taken all this information and input it somewhere which is amazing did you show some to my photos no i haven't had a chance we'll need to do that next time he sent me a stack of photos <laughs> no, no, don't do them online don't do them for people to see just let us some to see she'll die yes, i'm sure you have. but yeah you never no, no, no! I, I, I've, I've been up to my okay, yes. up to my eyeballs and absolutely everything. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow we have um, a conference. Uh, that Scott is also giving um, conference with other two about uh, artificial intelligence and actors, which is going to be funny to watch. Yeah, I wish I could get a machine to replace me. No, no, no! So that's tomorrow. It's for anybody who happens to be in Madrid. At one thirty in the afternoon, I'll be there. Where we're going to be talking about uh, there's recent European legislation, and the United Nations came to an agreement on today about the future of artificial intelligence in relationship to uh, governments, technology development, um, society, and of course, um, it's going to affect people who in, in the performing arts and in the recorded arts more than anything else. But apart from that, knowing him, it's going to be funny. And why, why, oh, why is there never artificial stupidity? <laughs> <laughs> because it's what we really live every day. <laughs> you, you, you should try interacting with, a, with, with everybody's favorite artificial intelligence. It, it says some pretty stupid things. Uh, okay. Listen to this. A global coalition of 35 European voice acting guilds and associations and, Euro and unions in France, Spain, etc., etc., um, United States, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, representing more than 20,000 artists, um, are in agreement to ensure the creative media and entertainment industry's use of AI in the dubbing and voiceover industry does not harm artistic heritage and human creativity and respects the rights of the artists. That is the UNESCO. No, no. The UNESCO is when somebody finds a, uh, a nice old castle that they want everybody to visit. What is that then? That that's uh, the UVA. I think it's United Voice Actors Association. It's an association of associations. But the the idea being that that now with artificial intelligence is they can not only translate what the actor is going to be saying on screen, but they can sample the act the same actor's voice, have it recreated uh, with uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, then dub them with something that sounds like them in a different language and manipulate their lips so it looks like it's them talking oh it's incredible it's incredible yeah and well, there you not go. pay you and not pay you that that's yeah, yeah. that's, that's the, the other issue the, that's the, why it's being developed so fast there's there's people who've had their voices printed and they've been used to create audio books without their permission the, the the resentment of the power of an actor is is is, is something for another day well, what, what you, no, well, what you've got because is you, you already have a very small parcel of land and that's all you've got. And then everybody's yeah, moving into it. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's like when I, I was doing a job and I said to the guy, I said, you don't do this very often. He said, no, no, no. I said, I'm a pediatrician. I said, uh, he says, I do this as a hobby. And I said, that's yeah. funny because my hobby is pediatrics. <laughs> I'll often go down to the hospital on a Saturday morning, see if there's any kids with a broken leg, you know. And just, you know, help out. I don't think he got the joke. <laughs> no. You know, but that's the thing where somebody's <clears throat> profession is somebody else's hobby. Anyway, Michael, it's been a delight and a pleasure. <laughs> profoundly so. And are remember, sure? we are all beautiful and we have secrets. Yes. You weren't bored, were you? <laughs> no. Okay, good. No, no, how is no, my, I wasn't. How, no. is, how is, no. my, how is <laughs> Michael... How is Michael Feast? I haven't seen him for years and years, but I mean, I hope he's well. How is it to he's work very, with him? I did a, I did, what did I do with him? I did, like, it wasn't Foil's War, it was, it was another play. It was, it was a play about, oh, I can't remember what it was even called. But it, it was called something like, it was set in Canary Wharf and it was about everything turning new. So it was about 1989, 80, 1990, something like that. Well, it has been said that the character of Withnail and Withnail and I is based on Michael Feast. Could be. Could be. 
Yeah, so that doesn't strike me, but but I mean, you know, I didn't, you know, he was a very nice man, very good actor. Mm, good. Um, yeah. Look, Lorena Fernandez Carrillo says, "Thank you. Always a pleasure to have you here." Just put it there. It's the last one. Oh, there we go. Lorena, thank How you. How very nice. Always a thank pleasure you. to have you here, yes. Lorena. Jasmina says, "Thank you." It was beautiful listening to you. Ja Jasmina is is one of those um, unicorns that we talk about. Jasmina learned uh, she lives in a small village in Catalonia, and thus she speaks Spanish in Catalan. But she had a neighbor when she was a, when she was a small girl who I believe was a Russian dancer and spoke English in perfect RP. So not only does she speak Spanish and Catalan, but when she speaks English, she speaks it in. A, an entirely flawless RP <laughs> that comes from yeah. nowhere. It's it's absolutely extraordinary where it comes from. Wow. Francisco says, it's great to see you, Michael. Always come back. Love to hear you sharing your knowledge. Very kind. Well, there you go. Thank you very much. Well, that's Francisco. That's delightful. So let's pack up for today because yes, okay. we have to get on because I have to I have to uh, put this thing together for tomorrow. Remember, one thirty tomorrow will be in the Ateneo, the Athene Ath Athenaeum of Madrid is how we would say in English, the Ateneo Athene de Madrid. Uh, that'll be one thirty in the afternoon. And remember, there's free beer afterwards. So um, I expect all the actors in Christendom to be there uh, in no uncertain <laughs> terms. You know, it's very unusual that, that, you know, they shouldn't say, you know, we're going to be talking about it. Just say free beer. And then put in, put in parentheses <laughs> afterwards, by the way, we'll be talking about this, <laughs> you know, um, but that, that, that's a cool thing we're doing tomorrow afternoon. Free beer without uh, jamón, so that is yeah, there's be... no, there's no, <laughs> yeah, there's no canapes, so line your stomach before you turn up, yes, ladies and germs. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's, it's been a delight. Thank you, Michael. And tomorrow we'll be back at 8 p.m. Yeah. live. Oh, and everybody will be able to watch us live tomorrow. Oh, yes. I've already set up the, the live stream so people can tune into that. And they can, Tomorrow at one thirty. They can watch me talking in Spanish to a large group of people, hopefully, who are just there for the beer. Um, but other than that, <laughs> it's been a delight. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. Um, and just be careful about, you know, what you're doing with your identity, as it were. Um, the, Michael said some, some issues with identity fraud. People yeah, it's here. S it's always at the beginning. stealing who he is. You know, what you should really be 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 careful of is if you turn around and all of a sudden you see in the paper that Michael Michael Fitzgerald appearing in in Hamlet in the West End, <laughs> giving us his Polonius, and you're like, that's not me. That's fraud. <laughs> no, <laughs> sadly, no. No, they can never be. <laughs> bye, bye, darling. You've stolen your equity card. Bye. bye. See you next week. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, and we'll be back soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Lots of love. Bye for now. Bye. So we're still here. We, now we can be incredibly informal. Um, <laughs> no, but Michael wants to go. Oh, Michael wants to go? Yes. No, I'm fine. All right. Oh, you're okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah. I'll it's, go in a minute. But. It's very interesting. When you, <laughs> when you were, when you were, um, when you, when you were at drama school or when you went and started working, do you remember, remember any moments where you, you felt you genuinely had a breakthrough that you worked out how, how it, you know, you worked out how something worked, you know? In acting? Um, well, like when I left drama school, I didn't even have an agent and I didn't try to get an agent because I didn't think I was ready yet mm -hmm. to, really to be in the profession. And then I ended up at the Young Vic as a walk on and in, as, as an ASM, an acting ASM. And it was a company that was simply delicious. It was fun. Everybody was fun and we loved each other. We still do, those of us that are still alive. And it was. Uh, I don't remember any breakthrough. I mean, I I know that I've always want I always wanted to, to belong to the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I didn't think that would happen as fast as it did because I thought that would be the ultimate thing to be. And I within 
I left drama school in 1976 and by 1980 I was in the company, mm. which I thought was amazing. And th that was, I suppose, a breakthrough. But I remember somebody said, well, what on earth made you sign a player's cast contract? And you thought uh, the chance to be in one of the best companies in the world and to learn. And the people that were there at the time you've seen who was there, it was, you know, yeah, they were brilliant. From David Suchet to, to Helen Mirren to Susan Fleetwood to I mean all those Alan Howard to all those actors and every single person we got on very well in that company there was not any kind of competition that went on there were some very young actors who well I was one of the very young actors but they felt that they were wasting their time there um, <sighs> But I, I've always thought it was a kind of learning thing. And in those days, you didn't want to do film immediately because you were still, they were still saying that film is what you do in order to make enough money in order to be able to do theatre. So I felt I was in the right place. But I wasn't really... I, I had to leave for half a year because my mother was dying abroad. And, and then they let me come back because I was playing, I haven't sent you a photograph of this one, Baby William Shakespeare in the Swan Down Glass, which was a pantomime written specially. And um, I came back and did that. Then I went to Stratford the next year and, and, and all of that. That was great. And then I left because they were going to go to America with, you, you have the photographs of me as Montfleury in that gold leather wig. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't want to go to Broadway and because yes you can have a career but they make you do the same thing for the rest of your life that's kind of the way I felt about America I felt and I I mean I, act, I want to be different every time I just did and maybe that was a mistake I don't know it was me though and mm -hmm. I didn't want to go and so I left um, and it was a great role to play but it was small and even more fun was the pastry chef, which was the naughtiest thing I've ever done because all I did was try to upstage the entire stage all the time and manage. I managed. Um, <laughs> very bad, but, but yeah, I mean, but breakthrough. And then I suppose I did a cup. I did. But did, but did you, in terms of in terms of acting itself, was there something where you realize that that you s sort of realized how something worked more than before? I was brought in to play the role that Jimmy Ewell plays in the interrogation of John. I'd never done a Northern accent before, and when Nick Renton rang the next day and it said it occurs to me that you're a potential murderer, one of the things I'd ask him in my interview was, "Who's playing the murderer?" And he said. That's why I thought you were a murderer, because you questioned me. <laughs> he said that later, and I don't know whether he's joking. It's like George Hall said at Central, we only took you because you said you hated musicals and we thought that needed fixing. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I don't hate musicals, but you know, I, did, I don't want to get stuck doing one thing, and believe me, I don't do anything anymore, so I, I didn't get stuck doing anything, really. <laughs> Good. But um, I suppose the interrogation of John was a breakthrough in a way, in that it, the, the praise was incredibly high, but there are not going to be other roles like that. Not really. Um, it, that, that was a kind of once-in-a-lifetime role. And I, don't, I think people used to think of me in the beginning, they thought I was classical. They didn't think I could be modern. That was quite, quite interesting. Hmm. Well, the, and the they other never th thought doing this, and so and then I did this, and they thought, oh. Well, the you other know, thing in the interrogation, and that I'm not like me. I mean, I look like me vaguely, but I'm not like me. Well, the other thing is in the interrogation of John, you you are Harry Lyme in the Third Man, in the sense that everybody talks about you, everybody refers to you, the everybody is is trying to work something out about you. Yeah, it's building it up so nicely, and you don't start talking for quite a while yeah. you don't start really yeah. revealing who you are so we have all of this built up around you yeah 
all of this is built up around you. So when you when you do the one thing that everybody wants you to do, which is speak, we are on tenterhooks. Is that there's the, yeah. this is because we at that stage we are in the pockets of the the police officers who want to get a confession of this guy. So um, it's they are, all they're all good. It's an huh? absolute jewel they're of a really, role. They're really good. The other actors. Oh, it's one. It's the it's one of the greatest roles ever written. I think it was written actually for Kevin McNally because Malcolm Mackay knew him, and Kevin McNally said to me. He said, I mean, he was really nice to me about it. I don't, didn't know him that well, but he said, I would never have played it like you played it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose my stance was, any of us could be this person given the right circumstances, I suppose. And I, I suppose I think somebody who is completely reprehensible, it might be quite good to make people at times feel pity for them. Yeah, no, no. Not only pity, he's also trying to understand what was going on. Yeah, and I knew. I, I mean, I had to sort out, and that's what a lot of actors I don't think can do. They don't know how to fill their heads with thinking or silence. Yes. It's hard for some people. Yes, yes. And I think it's something that I rather prized, but then I'd seen a lot of Bergman movies. It's like you watch Harriet Anderson wake up with cancer at the beginning of Cries and Whispers, and it's five ten minutes of her not speaking and you get the whole thing it's brilliant oh i love it i love it it's one of the great comedies yeah so uh -huh. i can it is <laughs> great musical yeah it's it's a great comedy i love the puppets in it uh i i never thought they would work but they do you know bergman can make anything work singing puppets. yes absolutely so i suppose that yes that was that was it. I mean, I always have the impression that somewhere people don't like me, but maybe that's just because I don't work. I think, well, a lot of people do like me, but I wonder, I wonder if I am a little bit, I am not the boy next door. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I guess I can try, but I, I think somewhere people think we don't know what he's going to do. Which is great. But yeah. That happens also in real life, you know, because you, you really are thoughtful, you really think, you really listen to the other person. I remember that, you know, the first time I met you. And that is your... Really? That is, oh, yeah, of course. Well, the, the, it's sort of the... You're, you, it's interesting because when, when, when I met you, I met you at the same time as I met Christian Mackay. Christian Mackay is, is, who, is wonderful company. He annoys yes. a lot of, He annoys a lot of people. And he's and he's used to being the smartest person in the room because he is. Let's let's face facts. He's one of the, the one of the at least one of the smartest people you you'll probably get to meet. And my God, does he let you know it? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, which, if you're somebody who is open to learning new things, is is quite thrilling. Yeah. Which I am. Because yeah, because yeah. so he's a, extremely good company. The thing the thing that Michael exudes is. He's the other smartest person in the room, but he doesn't. He doesn't say it. He doesn't try to show doesn't you it. Doesn't try to show you. Yes. So that's why it makes it very interesting conversation. Christian, Christian gets people's backs up. He just does, and because I, I would characterize him by saying that he is basically the glass is half empty with Christian, but he has. Manchester pomposity about him in terms of business. There is sort of that. That's too easy to say that, but he he's also it's like Tom Fontana took against him, but he'll he'll tell you if he thinks you're terrible. He will just he'll say it. That's the thing he does. And you think um well, what what do I think about Christian? I just think um he was a he was as good a musician as he was an actor. Mm. I mean, that yeah. performance of Orson Welles is the best thing I've seen him do. I've, not, I've seen him do other things and he's very, very good. He isn't always very bright about human behavior. Yes. That he doesn't, he's not stupid about it, but it's not particularly what he thinks about. And he doesn't really want to play roles because of what they're about emotionally. He wants to play them because he gets to copy somebody and be somebody new that exists. He re that really turns him on. And he's really, really good at it. In the same way that Michael Sheen is, but I think he's better than Michael Sheen. I love biographies. And I love biographies. It has such a such a responsibility. Yeah. 
also, you know, and I, I take it very seriously. I, I always yes. love that. Yeah. But I think if you're raised as a classical musician and a really good one, that there is a right and a wrong. You know, you either hit the note or you don't hit the note. You, if you're a dancer, you either have your leg in the right position or you don't. Or you stick out in, you know, or if you're in the school orchestra, your instrument goes, Ree! and you think, no, that's wrong. But an actor, there isn't a right and a wrong sometimes, and you can fudge things and people won't know. Yeah. It's not that it's a lesser art, it's different. That's an interesting observation. It's an interesting observation, the idea of playing real people. Uh, could you played Oscar Wilde, and we have no audiovisual records of them. Um, he played Orson Welles. You've, you've played people too. I love that. Um, perhaps when it comes down to the playing the real person, in terms of musical terms, that's when you get to play the Mozart or the Bach, because it's something which has already been proved, yes. has already been done definitively and you will be compared to the definitive version of it. And everybody, and that's why I, I did a calculation one day with the help of an artificial intelligence that I came to the conclusion between 25 and 35% of all nominated and winning actors and actresses at the Oscars are playing real people. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's what I mean. I, I would see, say, how do you win an Oscar? You play a royal. You will be nominated if you play a royal. Yeah. Americans love that. They love, they love, you know, Colin Firth, and they love Helen Mirren, and they. All you have to do is play a royal. And Playing royal, do you mean? Play royal, play a, a royal, queen or a, a king or a king. prince. Ah, okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. Either I'm that, or as Ricky Gervais says, play a mental. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, or you know, it's like they the, that the, the in the TV show extras when uh, Kate Winslet as herself is saying, if you want to win an award, you really sh you, you know the only reason she's doing the the um, the uh, the movie where she's a nun rescuing Jews from cellars is she's trying to win an award, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the other way to win it is by playing a mental. That's that's what she says. And she's uh, and she actually that's what she won a, won an Oscar for. <laughs> Nobody can remember what the movie was, mm -hmm. but it was the appropriate award to give her at that juncture, as it mm. were. You know. Anyway, look, let's let's get on with our okay. evening. Uh, it's a delight. We'll see okay. you next week. Um, I'm off to do some work right now. Thank you very much for everybody who's stuck in. Thank you very much. When, when the time comes, please send me this. I always try to learn something. Yes, I'll do. I'll send it. I'll send it straight after. Later, whenever. Yes, yeah, so don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll get it all done. Get it out of the way. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for for sticking with us. And in future, remember to subscribe and and like the channel and check out our other videos and all the other interviews and talks that we've given on various different subjects thank you <clears throat> and good night good night good night